What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of the sit down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of today's discussion in the comment section below. If this video here on a special Saturday sit down gets to 1,000 likes, I will give one lucky commenter a cash prize. So make sure you hit that like button. The quicker we get there, the quicker we do the giveaway. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit-down video today. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get into another very interesting organized crime topic. And as we talk about time and time again, these families are families within families. And one of the names that is synonymous with multiple families and the American Mafia is the Lino family. We've heard that name before, right? Bobby Lino, Eddie Lino, Frankie Lino. There were Linos all over the American Mafia, whether it was the Gambino crime family, the Bonanno crime family. Their name runs deep in the American Mafia. Today, we're going to get in to one of them, a man who was very interesting, a guy that has seen a lot in his time as not only a soldier, but a capo in the Bonanno crime family, ultimately leading to a major betrayal. The story of Frank Lino. Next on the sit down, Frank Lino was born October 30th, 1938 in Brooklyn, New York. He would grow up on West 8th Street in the very Italian enclave of Gravesend in Brooklyn. As we know at Gravesend, all sorts of American mobsters came up in that area, most notably as well in Bath Beach, Bensonhurst, all those areas are rife. In fact, we could attribute that most mobsters from Brooklyn come from those areas. Now, for Frank Lino, his father, Robert A. Lino, allegedly was part of the mafia and was a made member. Now, there's not a lot of info on Robert Lino, though. If you read into Mikey Scar's testimony, it is believed that he did talk about at one point Robert Lino. Now, Robert Lino, who was said to be Frank Lino's father, would die in 1989. Now, as I said at the outset, Frank Lino's family was steeped in the mob, whether it was brothers, cousins, sons, there were all sorts of Linos in the American Mafia. Now, Frank Lino would attend Lafayette High School in Brooklyn, New York, but he would drop out of the school that was in Bath Beach in the 10th grade. He would ultimately start hanging around Avenue U in Brooklyn and become part of a local street gang called the Avenue U Boys. Now, if you know anything about Frank Lino or Carmine Persco or all sorts of other gangsters from Brooklyn, a lot of people, most notably Italian-American males that grew up in the 50s, would become associated in Brooklyn with street gangs. We knew that with Persico uh, being part of the gang he was a part of. Frank Lino began running the streets. He began hijacking trucks, being involved in armed robberies, and he'd ultimately start running a floating card and dice game that moved around Brooklyn. He would eventually become close with Rosario Ganji, who would ultimately become a made member in the Genovese crime family, they would have a long lineage and friendship, which would be evident deep into their life, even into the 90s, uh, when Frank Lino and Ganji were involved in a stock scheme, which we'll get into. Now, uh, Frank Lino um, would ultimately uh, start hanging around some pretty shady characters, and he would become weirdly a part of a very sad um scene that would play itself out in 1962. In 1962, in the area of 48th Street and New Utrecht Avenue, two New York City police officer detectives would be killed. Now, I'm going to talk about this story. According to the report, a 25-year uh, sergeant called John Finnegan on the left and a partner, Luke Fallon, who had several years in the job, would respond to a a robbery call in that area of a tobacco shop. Uh, multiple individuals and perps were um, supposedly viewed uh, robbing that uh, business. 
to which these detectives responded. One of the individuals involved was this guy, a guy called Jerry Rosenberg, who was said to have ties to Frank Lino. They were friends at one point. Jerry Rosenberg, as well as several other um, suspects, would actually shoot at both Finnegan and Fallon as they walked through the front door, killing them instantly. Now, subsequently, after the tobacco shop robbery and killing, Rosenberg allegedly would hide uh, on um, kind of assistance from Frank Lino, allegedly. Now, down the road, several days later, Frank Lino would be accosted by the New York City Police Department and supposedly be severely beaten um, for housing a Jerry Rosenberg. Now, Frank Lino was not involved with the robbery or murder, but ultimately Jerry Rosenberg would be convicted and would spend 46 years in the New York State uh, prison um, facilities and would be at his death the longest tenured inmate in the New York State uh, prison uh, database. So he was obviously someone that would have to pay for his behavior, uh, but Frank Lena would also have to pay for uh, having some bit of involvement in this little dust up. Now, sadly, uh, the two officers would die and their end of watch was in 1962. Now, Frank Lena would ultimately become involved with several families, including the Gambino and Genovese crime families, but it would ultimately settle on the Bonanno crime family after he became close with Frank Coppa. Now, Frank Lino um, would become pretty close as an associate to Sonny Red and Delicato, uh, who, as we know, was close with Philip Jean Cohn and Dominic Trinchera. As we could see in a, a wedding photo, uh, it was very evident. Frank Lino was very close with uh, these individuals. And ultimately, in 1977, in an apartment owned by Sonny Red and Delicato in Little Italy, Frank Lino would become a made member of the Bonanno crime family, weirdly enough, on his birthday in 1977. Inducted alongside him were Dominic Big Trinch and Chera and Joe Benanti, among others. Things were good for Frank Lino. He was a bookmaker. He was a loan shark. He was an extortionist. By this point, Frank Lino had become involved uh, with unions as well. He had a no shirt job as a bus driver and would ultimately become very involved in the bus driver's union. He was making money. He would also uh, be evidently close to his cousin, Eddie Lino, who would become a made member in the Gambino crime family. He was involved with all sorts of things and was very close with the Gotti regime as well as others. Also, it must be made clear that in 1980, Eddie Lino's sister, Grace Lino, allegedly purchased drugs from an individual uh, called Michael Aiello. It's made clear that supposedly Frank Lino was so incensed by this, he would order a member of uh, his crew, a person called Ronald Monkey Man Filicomo, to kill Michael Aiello for selling drugs to his cousin. Uh, now, ultimately, that dude that uh, sold the drugs, Michael Aiello, would survive the hit. But Frank Lino was very close to his cousins, Eddie and Grace. Now, Grace Lino would ultimately marry Fat Sal Scala, who, alongside uh, Lino, uh, was a part of the Paul Castellano hit. They were the two individuals that killed Tommy Bellotti on the driver's side. So kind of a six degrees of separation with Frank Lino. Now, as I said uh, before, uh, Frank Lino was very close with the three capos, most notably his own capo, Sonny Red, as well as uh, Dominic Trinchera and Phil Lucky Giancone. Now, this would mean that Frank Lino would ultimately play a huge part in the three capos set. Now, I'm not going to go through all the things that involved the three capos hit that's been widely reported and done in many videos. Essentially the three capos were attempting to wrestle power away uh, from Joey Messino and Philip Ristelli. Little did they know Messino was planning a hit on all three of them. Now, Frank Lino is actually very involved with this because in May of 1981, Sonny Red and Delicata would come to him and essentially say that they were all called to a meeting and that the meeting could be dangerous, but you know everybody was looking to kind of get things straightened out. Uh, and Frank Lena was told by Sonny Red that, quote, 
if they're shooting, everybody is on their own. Just try to get out. So the thought was, according to Frank Lino, this was a pretty dangerous thing to go to. They knew that this could become a meeting where they would all die. But as mobsters, this is what they were going to do. Now, as a lot of people know, when you go to an administrative meeting in the mafia, no weapons are supposed to be there. So the three capos, as well as Lino, all went without weapons. Now, as we know, little did they know, there were shooters in closets and they would all burst out. Now, Frank Lino would say during the hit, as it went down, when he walked in, he ultimately kind of felt like things were a bit weird. He would say, we first walked in, we would walk downstairs and there was a room kind of like a storage room. He said, we would see Joey Messino as well from George from Canada, as well as a couple other Italian guys. Now, you would say in the main room, Sonny Red and Delicata was, quote, holding on to Joe's arm like a friend, like two friends. You hold an arm. And he said he believed that was due to the fact that he wanted Joey Messino close to him in the case something would pop off. Now, Frank Lino would also say that eventually he would see George from Canada slowly run his fingers through his silver hair. At that point, he would say that he saw a multiple people shoot and that hell would break loose. He would say as well, when they came in with the shotguns, big Dominic Trinchera would charge at them and make a loud noise, which they would then shoot him. Now, Frank Lino would ultimately say he would, quote, knock down George from Canada, Shasha. I don't know then, quote, I would jump over Trini. When I jumped over him, I saw Phil Lucky in the back getting killed. I would then see Joe Macedo hit Sonny Red and Delicato with an object. I don't know what it was. I was jumping over Trin to get out. I was jumping over his body. The guy was 6'6", 400 pounds. Now, uh, Sal Vitale would later say that he froze for five seconds, and by the time he and one of the other gunmen tried to shoot Frank Lino, Lino flew past them and was running very fast. Ultimately, Frank Lino would get out. He would escape and say he would just run down the street and wouldn't stop running until he got tired. So other than probably freezing, Frank Lino probably would have been killed that night. Um, he was very involved with this and probably knew the writing was on the wall. Um, but he is the one survivor of the sunny red camp, basically, that made his way out. Now, ultimately, for Frank Lino, uh, he would have to get in line and just kind of, um, you know, say his uh, sorries and, hey, I'm not with you, Joe Messino, because that's all he was able to do. Everybody that he was close to uh, had been uh, whacked out. Now, the son of Sonny Red, Bruno and Delicato, would ultimately also fall in line down the road. Um, but for Joe Messino, he always made sure to take care of Frank Lino. By getting in line, Frank Lino knew that if he got in line, he would likely get a promotion anyway. Joey Messino would ultimately make Frank Lino the acting capo of the old Sonny Red and Delicato crew. In that crew, it would include his cousin, Bobby Lino, Russell Morrow, as well as associates like Ronald Monkey Man Filicomo, and up-and-comers, Richie Ricciardi, and one Tommy Karate Patera. Now, not a lot of people know this, but Tommy Karate, when he was inducted into the family in the 80s, was sponsored by Frankie Lino. So Frank Lino had a pretty powerful crew, and he would ultimately become official capo of that crew by 1985. Now, Frank Lino would also have some other involvement in a very big murder in 1981 as well. 1981 was a big year for Frank Lino. He would ultimately as well drive Dominic Sonny Black Napolitano to a home in Brooklyn belonging to Ronald Filicomo's father, where he would push Dominic Napolitano down the steps to where Dominic Napolitano was killed. So Frank Lino had a huge 80. Let's just be honest. He was around some really historical events in the mafia. He lived a wild life in the Bonanno crime family. Now, one thing we would find out about 
Frank Lino's personal life is that he loved sports, most notably football and baseball. And this would obviously be made very clear in this awesome uh, <laughs> mug shot that Frank Lino would give as he has the Packers Patriots Super Bowl um, a sweatshirt on, which is pretty funny. But one thing we would find out by the mid 80s and, and by the almost late 80s, early 90s is that Frank Lino was very close, allegedly, to Mets closer John Franco. Now, if you know anything about John Franco, John Franco is from Bensonhurst. He is an Italian-American, uh, and there's always been mob connections that John Franco has had. Um, not that he was in the mafia, not that he did anything for the mafia, but he definitely knew mobsters, including Anthony Spiro. Now, according to Frank Lino, he would say that in 1993, he alongside – uh, Anthony Spiro, as well as Frank the Fireman Porco, they were told to go to Montreal on orders from Joey Messino to tell the Montreal faction, the Bonanno crime family, led by Vito Rizzuto, that you know essentially Joe Messino was the new boss officially. Now, during the time in Montreal, it's alleged that Frank Lino, Spiro, and Porco would go to a Mets game. Um, from tickets from John Franco. They would play the Expos that weekend. And according to Frank Porco down the road after the game, they were seen partying with Franco as well as other Mets teammates. So Frank Lino was, uh, you know, a baseball fan. And, and due to his connections with John Franco, he was given tickets many times to Mets baseball games. Now, we would find out years later that John Franco never had any actual mob criminality connections, but he definitely knew Spiro and Porco and Frank Lino. Now, Frank Lino was obviously a very strong capo in this family, but he also was making a lot of money as well. Eventually, Frank Lino would get involved with a pump and dump scheme involving stocks, uh, most notably penny stocks. According to the federal indictment that would drop in 1997, they would say that through bribes and threats, Frank Lino, as well as Rosario Ganji, his old friend, were engaged in connecting a company in Arizona that sold health and fitness clubs, and they artificially inflated and placed um, bids and, and ultimately other stock tips, uh, as well as getting people to buy into the stock through artificially inflating the stock. Now, through wiretaps, it was also alleged that Ganji and Lena were involved not only in that, but gambling as well through a wiretapped conversations. In 1997, the indictment would drop on Lino, Ganji, and other members of the mafia. And Frank Lino would ultimately get 57 months in prison for being involved in this pump and duck dunk scheme. Pump and dump scheme. My apologies. At one point during the trial, Frank Lino would claim, quote, he didn't even know where Wall Street was. Uh, so you know, down the road, he would have to plead guilty. But according to him, he didn't even know where it was. Now, we would also find a very funny thing that would go on as Frank Lino gets sentenced. The judge in the case, a person called Denny Chin, uh, would tell Frank Lino that his original surrender date to go to prison was on September 10th, 1999. Now, Frank Lino would lodge a request to Dennis Chin saying, quote, that he had tickets to a baseball game involving the Yankees and Red Sox on September 10th, 1999, and that he was, quote, hoping to go to it and was asking Chin to push his sentence surrender date back four days. Now, in a wild stroke of luck, Dennis Chin allegedly told Lino, quote, I'm a Yankee fan, too, and pushed his surrender date back four days. So Frank Lino got an extra four days on the street. Now, we would later find out that Frank Lino didn't even have tickets to the game, and he was spotted at a bar that night. Now, sadly for Frank Lino, he should have went to the game because that evening, Pedro Martinez would strike out 17 Yankees en route to a 3-1 to -one victory. Um, but he ended up getting four extra days on the street due to the complying of Dennis Chin. Now, he would head off to prison in the late 90s, and his crew 
would be given to da uh, Daniel Mongelli, who was essentially a protege of Frank Lino. And as Frank Lino is in prison, uh, he is indicted in 2003. As we know, in 2003, uh, Sal Vitale, Joey Messino, all the high-ranking members of the Bonanno crime family are indicted in early 2003. And the problem that Frank Lino had was he would learn that Sal Vitale ultimately flipped days later. And as many people in the Bonanno crime family knew, Sal Vitale flipping would be a death nail to them. Frank Lino knew that as well. He knew that at this point, you know, he's in his 60s. If he gets 20, 25 years, that's a life sentence. And Frank Lino knew that he did a lot of dirt. I mean, he was involved in murders. He was involved with a lot of racketeering. He was a gangster. He was a capo in the Bonanno crime family. He knew that Vitaly's testimony would do him in. He would decide as well, Frank Lino, to become a government informant. Now, he would become particularly damaging to Joey Messino. Remember, Frank Lino had intimate knowledge of the three capos hit. Okay, he could in, you know, incriminate Messino on all sorts of things. It's alleged that Frank Lino had Joey Messino implicated on four different murders. He would talk about the three capos hit. He would talk about the Sonny Black hit. He would talk about all sorts of things. And Frank Lino would also, and this is quite disgusting, he would also talk about his own son. By this point, his son, Joe Lino, had become a soldier in the family. He would be made in 1996 alongside Danny Mongelli. At one point, Frank Lino would even start talking about his son's uh, illegal bus company that was controlled by the Bonanno crime family, a company called Street Smart Transportation. He would tell the FBI that his son was, quote, a loan shark, an extortion artist. He would also tell the government that his son was, quote, a huge gambler and was unlucky and had lost a significant amount of money. Um, so Frank Lino had no allegiance, not even to his own son. Um, and he would put many members of the mafia away, including Joey Messina. Now, we all know Joey Messina would down the road cooperate himself. By 2006, Frank Lino would end up getting about eight years in federal prison and he would be given time served in 2014. He would enter the witness protection program and has not been heard or seen from since. As far as we know, Frank Lino is still alive and is 84 years old, living somewhere in America. He's never turned up. And this is something that is synonymous with a lot of these old Bonanno guys. Some have turned up. Richard Cantarella turned up. He did some interviews, did a television show. But for the most part, most of these old school Bonanno guys that flipped have decided to stay out of the limelight. They have not come to YouTube. They have not done any interviews. Now, one thing I do know, I don't know a lot about where Frank Lino is. I'm not aware of that. Um, I do know Sal Vitale is still alive. He lives, I believe, in the Midwest somewhere from what I know. Um, I think Wisconsin. I'm not exactly sure, though. Joey Messino has not come around either. From what I know, Joey Messino lives in Florida alone in an assisted living facility. So, look, would it be interesting to have some of these guys from the Bonanno family come out? Absolutely. And I will say this. I always say this in these videos. If Frank Lino or anyone connected to him at this point watches this, I would be very interested in interviewing you if you'd like to comment, contact me. Frank Lino is an interesting guy. He's a government informant, but he has stayed under the limelight and will die probably alone. We all know that he doesn't have a relationship with his son who he uh, implicated in mob activity. Lino is an interesting guy, though. Gang member involved with housing a cop killer involved and participated and was shot at in the three capos hit participated in the sunny black murder was a very powerful capo and then realized that vitality was going to do him in and flipped himself just another person in the long history of the american mob as always if you enjoyed this video hit that like button and make sure you subscribe we'll see you next week here on the sit down